أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال إبراهيم رب اجعل هذا البلد آمنا وجنبني وبني أن نعبد الأصنام رب إنهن أضللن كثيرا من الناس فمن تبعني فإنه مني ومن عصاني فإنك غفور رحيم ربنا إني أسكنت من ذريتي بواد غير ذي زرع عندك بيتك المحرم ربنا ليقيم الصلاة فاجعل أفئدة من الناس تهوي إليهم وارزقهم من الثمرات لعلهم يشكرون رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله ثم أما بعد A couple of days ago I shared with you that we want to discuss the couple of dialogues that Allah Azza wa Jal has with Ibrahim alayhi salam, in particular those pertaining to the dua that he made with Allah. This dua, there's a near consensus of the scholars, most of it takes place after the house of Allah was built, and we will discuss the evidence of that when the time comes, inshaAllah ta'ala. The beginning of this dua is similar to what we found also in Surah Al-Baqarah. This is of course Surah Ibrahim, ayat uh, 35 and on. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا الْبَلَدَ آمِنًا When Ibrahim alayhi salam said, My Lord, make this city peaceful. وَجْنُبْنِي وَبَنِيَّ أَنْ نَعْبُدَ الْأَصْنَامِ And protect me, avoid it from me, ward off from me and from my children that we may end up worshipping idols. That we may worship idols, al-Aslam. Now in this dua you will notice Ibrahim alayhi salam uses the word prevention, ijtinab or you know, jamb in this case, wajnubni. In another qira'a, ajnibni, which is the same meaning. And he doesn't include his father. He will include his father later on. But he doesn't include him here. That's because for the father it's already too late. You see, his son, him and his son have not committed this shirk yet. And this is actually another evidence against the argument that, Oh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, first he did shirk with the sun and the moon and the stars. And eventually he figured out about Allah. <laughs> Right? That's actually absolutely incorrect. And there are multiple evidences against that in the Qur'an. Even though that dialogue, dialogue is there, from his mouth, his mouth we read, هَذَا رَبِّي هَذَا أَكْبَرَ etc. This is my Lord, this is bigger, he says about the sun, for example. Right? And then in the end he says, لَا يُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ I don't love those who, who descend, who sink in. But that was all demonstration. None of that was actually his genuine statements. And the proof of that is even here. He's asking that he be prevented from and his children be pre prevented from the worshipping of idols. But he doesn't include the father because the father we all know was already guilty of this. Rabbi inna hunna abdullalna kathiran minan nas. But you still notice the respect he has for his father. His father is one of the leaders of, you know, the propagators of shirk in the tribe. He's one of the head figures. I mean, the guy manufactures idols. You all know this. But he doesn't say about his father or about the mushrikeen directly because they include his father at this moment. So the way he phrases it, even though he hates shirk, I mean, who will hate shirk more than Ibrahim alayhi salam? He says, Rabbi, my Lord, inna hunna adlalna kathiran minan nas. Without a doubt, the idols have misled many of the people, many from the people. He doesn't say the mushrikeen have misled, or my father or the leaders of the mushrikeen have misled. Who does he blame? Uh, this is again out of honor, you have to understand. He understands this too, the idols don't do anything. It is the people who promote the idols and manufacture them and call the people to worship them. But here again, the regard for his father. So he says, إِنَّ هُنَّ أَضْلَلَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ Subhanallah, alayhi salam. So he says, without a doubt, they have misled many, many from among the people. Another thing that's been mentioned about this, these asnam, is that these worship, these idols of worship that cause people to commit shirk, that mislead people, they're of many kinds. And in the ancient times, they were physical statues, you know, like physical figurines or dolls or, you know, uh, uh, carved out idols or rocks that people used to worship, or even trees and other things like that. 
But as time progressed, human beings matured more and more. And along with the maturity of human beings, shirk also matured. And so shirk is not just in the form of physical idols anymore. That is still there in some cases. But that's not the only kinds of idols that are out there. They're also now ideological idols. They're idols that are in the mind, right? For example, the idol that many people carry with them, that they're in charge, that they're in control. They've put themselves at par with the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَهُوَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ But they feel like they're in charge, they're in control. There are people who put their trust in material things. They completely trust the physical. And they don't believe that they have to rely on anything other than the physical. Right? They believe in, they say they believe in modern science. Basically what that means is I believe in physical existence. Nowadays when people say that, right? So they don't believe in any external divine intervention, any sort of metaphysical being that will intervene and act that has any power on anything. It is just, everything is just boils down to science. Okay? So these are people that are putting science and the physical at par with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the last century we saw Newtonianism. You know, up until the early last century. People believe that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And that's something really scary because, you know, I was in 8th grade in Pakistan and we had to take physics, physics, chemistry, biology, I still remember. And you have to take your physics exam. And in the physics exam there's a section of true and false. And this is a Muslim country supposedly, right? And I'm taking an exam in Pakistan and the true multiple choice question is matter can neither be created nor destroyed. And if I put that as false, I'll get points off. Because Newton said, matter can neither be created nor destroyed, so I have to mark it as correct. But only Allah Azza wa Jal is lam yalid wa lam yulhad, right? Everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is created and will be destroyed. Kullu man alayha fan, right? But yet this was, you know, you know, so subtly introduced into the curricula of the world. And people ate into it and, and, and you know, were completely taken in by it without even giving it a second thought that this might conflict with what you believe in. So these are other types of idols, you know, intellectual idols that come before people. And we have to watch out especially for those idols, especially when it comes to the educational system. Because, you know, of course, now we know, okay, well, matter can be created and it can be destroyed and now there's Einsteinian physics and we're moving beyond, you know, the ancient realm of physics. But, you know, most people, according to sociologists, they still live in the Newtonian age. They still, in the back of their heads, they think matter cannot be created and cannot be destroyed, right? And that's just one example of shirk in our times. So these sorts of intellectual forms of shirk, that take the form of textbooks and intellectuals and thinkers and names and famous theories that exist in our time. They've also m misled how many, however many people, and these are also asnam. So, Rabbi, inna hunna adlalna kathiran minan nas. Faman tabi'ani fa innahu minni. Then whoever follows me, then without a doubt he is from me, meaning he is aligned with me. Not too long ago, I have a habit of listening to, um, you know, uh, evangelical radio and also like, uh, you know, modernist, atheist radio and stuff like that, these arguments that people present. And there was this comedian on athe atheist radio, anti-Christian radio. He was actually, she was actually giving an anti-Christian rant, but it happens to be anti-Muslim also, in that case. She was saying, what kind of people are you? You believe in Ab Abraham, and he was willing to kill his child. In what world do you think that that's something you'd want to, you know, make a role model out of? People love Abraham, why do they love him? What's wrong with you people? He was killing his child. Nowadays, a person like that will be given the death penalty, etc., etc., etc. And here the average Muslim who doesn't know much about their deen is sitting there thinking, yeah, she's got a pretty good argument. Why would he want to kill his own child? That sounds pretty... And then he says, God made me do it, right? And nowadays if somebody kills their child and they go to court and you say, why did you do it? And say, God made me do it. You know, these people, these people are crazy. They're fanatics, Right? So she attributes that to Ibrahim alayhi So how do, we, how do we defend that? Even for our own selves, not to mention our children. Because this will be taught as extremism in religion. Fundamentalism in religion. And you have fundamentalism in religion, they will say. In all religion, they will say, right? You see, the Muslim understands that whatever Allah commands is moral. And whatever Allah forbids is immoral. Allah did not command us to slaughter our children. He didn't. He didn't. Allah commanded, however, Ibrahim alayhi salam in that particular instance. So for him, the most moral thing, the, the most correct thing he can do is to slaughter his child. For him. 
And Allah Azza wa clarifies this concept for the Muslims, so he's never concerned about this again. Because this again formulates a type of shirk. How come God said something that doesn't make any sense? That's the bottom question, right? That's the question that comes in the back of the mind. Why would God say something that doesn't make sense? Well, if you ask that question, you've already committed shirk. Why? Because you're convinced that what makes sense to you is at a higher level than what Allah has said. If Allah spoke, by definition, it comes from the highest form of wisdom. My wisdom, my knowledge, my common sense is here, and Allah's has no limit. So if in my little head, it doesn't make sense, that, that doesn't make any case against what Allah Azza wa Jal revealed, you follow? So he says, وَلَوْ أَنَّا كَتَبْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَنِ اقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ If we had written to the people, if Allah had, Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, this is ayah number 66, very peculiar ayah of Qur'an on this subject. Allah says, if we made mandatory on people to commit suicide, kill themselves, or leave their homes, even if they have a home, become homeless. Now both of these things, committing suicide or, and becoming homeless despite having a home, both of them make no sense, not to me. But Allah says, if Allah had said it, لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ It would have been better for them. What is Allah proving here subhanahu wa ta'ala? It doesn't matter if it makes sense to you or not. What matters is, is it from Allah or not? So the question that should be asked on radio is, not whether this makes sense or not. The question is, was that actually from Allah or not? And can we prove that? Can we argue that? Is this actually revelation from Allah? If once you establish it's from a higher source, then you can't question what's inside it. But the real question to argue is, is it in fact from Allah? And those are the core questions that revelation answers. Those are the core questions that the Messenger ﷺ defends. Is this in fact from Allah? Is this in fact a tanzeel, in fact a revelation? So let's go forward. رَبِّ إِنَّهُنَّ أَضَّلَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ فَمِنْ تَبِعَنِي Then whoever follows me, even though it seems an intellectual in our times, whoever follows me, فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي Then he is certainly from me. وَمَنْ عَصَانِي and whoever disobeyed me, فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ And you know, this is again the wisdom of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam also understands there is one sin that Allah does not forgive. Which one is that? Shirk. The beginning of this ayah is talking about shirk. Idols. The idols have misled many from mankind. Whoever follows me, meaning he was on tawheed. So you would think, وَمَنْ أَشْرَكَ And whoever does shirk, but he knows that Allah doesn't forgive shirk. So he put it in another way. He said, وَمَنْ عَصَانِي Whoever disobeyed me, فَإِنَّكَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Then certainly you are forgiving, exceedingly forgiving, constantly merciful. What wisdom do we get from this? There will be people who do less than shirk, who he wants to still make a case for them. Because if he said, فَمَنْ أَشْرَكَ then he wouldn't include any of the people who do less than shirk. So he's saying among his children, there will be those that are misled. And hopefully they have some, you know, they can make tawbah and come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the precise wording of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Rabbana, then he makes dua, our Lord, inni askantu min dhurriyati, I have settled down for out of my children, biwadin ghayri di dar'in, in a valley in which there is no growth, no cultivation. And this is of course Mecca. عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ Right around your sanctified house. Now, this is obviously a dua after the house was built. Because if the house was not built, why would he say around your sanctified house? The house was commanded to be built to Ibrahim alayhi salam. So عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ Now he tells, the, tells Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his intention. I have moved them, I have transferred them. You know you transfer from Egypt or Pakistan or Bangladesh to United States, or you tra transfer from like New York to New Jersey or to like Texas or something, right? And you transfer, and whenever you move your family somewhere, there's an intention, there's a reason. And it's either job, or it's business, or it's tax advantages, or the rent is cheaper or something, you know? He gives the reason why he settled his family down. One reason, Rabbana لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ So they would establish the prayer. So they would make the salah. So you will notice, alhamdulillah, we see the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam being revived, alhamdulillah, across the country. Masajid are being built, and people are moving close to the masajid. The Muslims are moving, 
in the vicinity of the masajid. It used to be a couple of decades ago, the, the trend was you, you buy the masjid in a really poor neighborhood where the real estate is cheap, and the Muslims live in the much richer neighborhood, so they drive to the masjid and then drive back to their <laughs> neighborhoods. But now, alhamdulillah, the masajids are being built, and Muslims are occupying the neighborhoods, and slowly those neighborhoods are being populated. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the ability to live near the masjid, inshaAllah ta'ala. So, رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Our Lord, so they would establish the salah. فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِّنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ This also shows us that the previous dua has already been made. First of all, he uses the word أَفْئِدَة as opposed to قُلُوب. I'll tell you the brief translation. Then make the, peop, the, the hearts from among the people inclined towards this house. But now here, or towards these people actually, the people of Mecca. But the word first, interesting thing is the word أَفْئِدَة as opposed to قُلُوب. قُلُوب also means hearts, you probably know. And fu'ad and af'idah also means hearts. This is a big discussion in, in, in linguistics. The difference between af'idah and qalb. But one of the more, the stronger evidences is the fu'ad refers to the height of emotions. Passionate emotions, right? And it's the top part. The top layer of the heart is also fu'ad. So the qalb is the part that changes, and that can be satisfied, and that can alternate. And the part that has the extreme emotions, extreme love, extreme anger, right? Extreme desire, extreme you know, compassion, that's the fu'ad. So he says, make the fu'ad, the af'idah of the people, the passionate hearts of the people, from among them, minan nas. Now there's two ways, you know, in those of you who know a little bit Arabic, you could say af'idah tan nas, mudaf mudaf ilay, the, the hearts of the people. But, he's, but, but he doesn't say af'idah tan nas, he says af'idah tan minan nas. So not all of the people's hearts will be inclined towards Makkah and the people of Makkah, there will be some among the people. And Ibn Kathir rahimahullah comments, if Allah Azza wa said, Af'idah tannas, and he took the min out of here in this dua, then Allah would have accepted and there would have been no Jews or Christians or anybody else because they would all have been inclined towards Al-Masjid Al-Haram. They wouldn't be inclined anywhere else. They would be inclined towards the people of Makkah. Tahwi ilayhim that they will be inclined towards them. Warzukhum min thamarat and provide them from provisions. You remember like yesterday we talked about the dua, Warzuk ahlahu min thamarat man amana bilhum billahu liyum al akhir. Right? Now, there he put a condition provide the children who believe in Allah in the last day. Here we don't find that condition. Why not? Because it's already indirectly mentioned in minan nas. It's not for all of the people, it is out of the people. Out of which, which people are going to have their hearts inclined towards Makkah? The people who believe in Allah in the last day. So he's putting those, that same condition in a different way. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ So that they may be grateful. Now in the end of this passage, we're going to find إِنَّ رَبِّي لَسَمِيعُ الدُّعَاءِ And I want to mention something about this ayah, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ And Qurtubi rahimahullah comments on this ayah. And he says, when Ibrahim alayhi salam left his, his wife and his child, and she asked him, why are you leaving us? He wouldn't answer. Then finally she asked him, is it your Lord commanded you? Allahu amarak. And then he said, Naam, this is Allah's command. So she, you know, she wasn't worried after that and he left and he went far enough so he couldn't see them. When he went far enough that he couldn't see them, then he started making the dua that is quoted here. And then he, then, then Al-Qutubi rahimahullah comments that when he reached the words, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ So that they, the family, the people that will live there, they can be grateful, that is when the water came out. At, this, at the moment that he said these words, that's when the water came out and the baby was fed. Subhanallah. رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ تَعْلَمُ مَا نُخْفِي وَمَا نُعْلِن Our Lord, you know what we keep hidden and what we announce. What we say is something, what we mean is, is another. I love Allah, I trust in Allah. You can say it, but who means it? Right? We can say, I obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I love the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu He knows what we say, but he also knows how much of it we mean. What of it is actually in our hearts? So, رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ تَعْلَمُ مَا نُخْفِي وَمَا نُعْلِن وَمَا يَخْفَى عَلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءِ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي السَّمَاءِ And what is going to be hidden from Allah? Anything at all, whether it be on the earth or in the sky. Alhamdulillah. All praise be to Allah. And now look. الَّذِي وَهَبَ لِي عَلَى الْكِبَرْ إِسْمَعِيلْ وَإِسْحَاقْ May praise be to Allah, all of it. And you know, Alhamdulillah, is a, is a, we have to have a dafs on just the words Alhamdulillah, because they're very powerful words, the way they're constructed in Qur'an. The one who granted me despite old age, Ismail and Ishaq. Anyone know the difference in age between Ismail and Ishaq, alayhim as-salam? Ismail, as-salam, according to Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah, was born at the age of 99 for Ibrahim, alayhim as-salam. 
And then there's a difference of opinion about Ishaq who's the younger brother, whether 110 or 111 or 112. So the at maximum difference is 14, 13 years, minimum is 10, 11 years. So that's about the difference between Ismail and Ishaq Inna Rabbi la dua. Without a doubt, my Lord is the one who hears the dua. Now these words are later. My, word, my Lord hears the dua. But the dua that he should, you know, they should be provided with provision, even though he's left them in the barren valley, that dua has already been fulfilled. He can't see them and the waters come out. And even then he says, Alhamdulillah. You see, he's put his family in an impossible situation, and now that he can't even see them anymore. You know, there's one thing, you can see your family in trouble, you kind of can go back and help them. But he's put his complete trust in Allah. So he waits until he can't even see them. And then he says, Alhamdulillah, who granted me Ismail and Ishaq. And then in, in this dua, there's also an acknowledgement. Wahhab, you know this Wahhab, Allah's name, Wahhab, or Yahabu in the present tense. This is to give a gift. A gift that someone doesn't deserve. You know a gift? There's one, you did something good, I'll give you a big gift. Right? But then there's a gift, you don't deserve anything. It's not a special occasion, you didn't win a prize or anything. Now gifts necessarily are not something you deserve over and above what you deserve. But there's usually an occasion and then you get a gift. Right? But when you get a gift and there's no occasion, then this is wahab. So Allah said, He acknowledges that, Ibrahim, that Ismail and Ishaq, they're His sons, but in reality, they are undeserved gifts from Allah. Our children are gifts from Allah. We don't deserve them. We don't own them. When they're taken away from us, from us, we don't complain to Allah, Allah, you took my child. No, no, no. It was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was letting us hold on to this amana. So look at the words. Again, Ibrahim alayhi salam and his sensitivity to Tawheed and his acknowledgement of Allah in all situations. So despite my old age, he gifted me Ismail and Ishaq. Without a doubt, my Lord, he hears the dua. And he heard the dua when he granted him these children. And we end with these two ayat, رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّةِ All of you know these words, inshaAllah ta'ala. My Lord, make me one who establishes the salah. Ibrahim alayhi salam is asking, that I, make me one who establishes the salah. You see the, the humility he has before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the value he knows of Tawheed. He doesn't have the confidence in him that once I have it, I've, I've already been declared Imam over mankind eventually, you know. Or you know, I've, I'm a messenger after all, revelation comes to me. So I don't have to worry about these things. I'll have my salah taken care of. Even he's asking Allah. Where does that leave us? Oh, my, our, my Lord, make me the establisher of salah. وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِي And out of my children also. And he didn't say وَذُرِّيَّتِي He said وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِي Out of my children. Because he knows that all of his children will be Muslims. So he says وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَا And our, our Rabb accept the dua. One of the beautiful lessons we get in this ayah alone is that if you want your dua to be accepted, what do you need to do? Establish the salah. First he says, make me one who establishes the salah, and out of my children, and then he makes the dua. So you want dua to be accepted? Establish your salah, make a concern out of establishing your children's salah, and then make dua to Allah. And then call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُمُ الْحِسَابِ There about this ayah, there is one opinion that states that when Ibrahim alayhi salam had made this dua, he did not know that his father, either he did not know that the father was dead yet, or he did not know that it was not allowed for him to make dua for his father who had already passed away. So he made, because he was a mushrik and you can't make dua for the mushrikun. So, رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْلِي My Lord, forgive me وَلِوَالِدَيَّ And for, in case of both of my parents. وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُمُ الْحِسَابِ And for the believers, the day on which the hisab, the, the accounting, the great audit is going to be held. So he makes this dua first for himself, then for his parents, then for all of the believers. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given most of us the gift that our parents are Muslims. That we shouldn't, you know, uh, be unmindful of these du'as that we have memorized since childhood because these du'as have a great legacy. They come from great situations. They come from the mouth of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Imagine the word, these words are not cheap. They are priceless gifts of Allah to us. So when we make these du'as and we recite these, especially these du'as, they come up in salah and you recite them. Don't read them like you're in a hurry and you have to get back to work. 
And don't make these du'as and you're just, you know, you've already made salam in your head before you made the salam. <laughs> right? Because you, something's already in your head that you got to get done. Right? Don't do it like that. Give these du'as their worth. Take your time in making du'a, especially du'a. You know, the du'a mukhul ibadah, the essence, the head figure, the, the, the core of the ibadah is du'a. Is du'a. So make your salah to an experience of du'a, not an experience of cardiovascular exercise, inshaAllah ta'ala. Right? So with this, we conclude uh, the passage dedicated to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. May Allah azza wa jal makes of people that establish the salah and give our future generation the concern that Ibrahim alayhi salam had for his children. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.